Hi everybody, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. Let's continue our discussion of respiratory anatomy. And on, in this video, we're going to focus on the pharynx as well as the larynx. In layman's terms, we tend to refer to the pharynx as our throat because the, the pharynx or our throat is indeed mostly the most posterior portion of the nasal cavity area and the oral cavity area and a bit beyond that. So it literally allows for our nose and mouth to be connected to the larynx and the esophagus. The larynx is going to turn eventually into our trachea. Notice that it starts at about the level of the base of the skull and it continues to about the sixth or second to last cervical vertebra. It's made up of skeletal muscle and we can differentiate three regions and we have colored these regions differently on the diagram. Let's take a closer look at each one of these regions because they tend to have slightly different functions. First of all, the nasopharynx, which you can see here in the light green, which is that very, very most posterior portion of our, or the area really posterior to the nasal cavity, that's really how I should express it. That particular part of our pharynx is really designed for the passage of air only except when your kid or you accidentally bring food up to where you um, emit food through the nasal cavity, which happens to all of us. But it's really not designed for the passage of food. It's only designed for the passage of air. And therefore, we see that it's lined with pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue. To prevent food from moving up into the nasopharynx, we depend on our soft palate moving upward and that tiny little flappy thing that you see in the back of your mouth called the uvula is also going to play a role in closing off that nasopharynx when we begin the swallowing reflex. Another thing to point out is that the tubes that get infected so often in our little children um, called the auditory tubes or the pharyngo, which stands for pharynx, tympanic, which is a portion of the, the ear, the inner ear. Uh, tubes get so often um, infected in little children and they actually open up into this particular region of the pharynx called the nasopharynx. By the way, you will see these auditory tubes also being referred, referred to as eustachian tubes, so you may have seen that terminology as well. So the nasopharynx is really, pharynx is only designed for the passage of air, but the oro and the laryngopharynx, which you see in the bluish color and then the purplish color, they are lined with stratified squamous epithelial tissue. So they're designed to handle quite a bit of friction, which is why food can pass through that portion of the pharynx as well. As you know very well, we can breathe through our mouth. I'm sorry, I should be writing that. We can breathe through our mouth, but we can also ingest food through our mouth. And consequently, our mouth has a dual function. It, it's part of our respiratory system and, uh, I'm sorry, it's part of our digestive system, but at some level you can argue that it's also part of our respiratory system. So with the air that we inhale through the nose goes down the pharynx, the air that we bring in through our mouth goes down the pharynx, but also the food goes down the pharynx. And ultimately, there's going to come a point where a decision needs to be made about where the air goes and where the food goes. And so that brings us to the larynx, because associated with the larynx, we see the epiglottis. You see that in the red here, and we see it here in the red again. Um, the red, by the way, is not at all indicating that it's vascularized. Uh, as a matter of fact, the epiglottis is made up of elastic cartilage. So it's a very springy structure. 
but stiff structure still that can close off when we begin the swallowing reflex. And what is it going to close off? It's going to close off the entrance of the trachea. And that entrance point we refer to as the glottis. So the epiglottis, which sits on top of the glottis, covers the glottis, which is the entry point or the beginning of the opening into the um, trachea. Entry point into trachea. Scribble, scribble. Sorry, you guys. Now notice that the larynx is a pretty complex structure. There are many other cart cartilage pieces, and by no means do I expect for you to uh, memorize these for lecture so much. And in, in, in lab, you will have to know these details. I do, I would like for you to be somewhat familiar with the biggest piece that you see right here called the thyroid cartilage. And that gets really pronounced right here in males, which we refer to as the Adam's apple. So we have a total of nine pieces of cartilage that make up the larynx. And notice that we see a transition from, the, from stratif stratified squamous epithelium that is still part of your pharynx to pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue as we go into the trachea. So right here where we see these rings or C-shaped pieces of cartilage, hyaline cartilage, uh, those are part of the trachea. So all the light blue pieces of cartilage, by the way, are um, examples of hyaline car cartilage. The epiglottis is the only one that is elastic cartilage. Because the larynx holds our vocal cords, as we'll see in the next slide, we often refer to the larynx in layman's terms as the voice box. So by now it should be clear that one of the main functions of the larynx is to ensure that food that we ingest makes it into the esophagus rather than the trachea with the help of the closing off of the trachea with the epiglottis during the swallowing reflex. We also have vocal cords present in the, the, the larynx. So this is a superior view into the larynx where it's as if we're sending a camera down your throat into the larynx. And there we see that there are these folds that are very poorly vascularized right here. Um, this is, I'm going to use a different color. This right here is what's going to lead, or that's the opening that will lead into the trachea. So it's essentially the glottis, you could say leads into the trachea. You could argue that that's pretty much the glottis area. And so we have right here these rather poorly vascularized true vocal cords. They're the ones responsible for voice production. Uh, you might at times also see um, vest uh, or um, talk talking about the false vocal cords, which are these vestibular folds which sit external to the true vocal cords. So these are your false vocal cords. And they really do not play a role at all in voice production. So with, with the help of the vocal cords, we can make this opening right here, we can make that bigger or smaller, and that's going to impact, of course, our voice. During the swallowing reflex, we will also notice that the larynx actually moves superiorly if you put your fingers on your thyroid cartilage, remember the prominence that we've had in the thyroid card cartilage is your Adam's apple, and you swallow, you'll feel that that Adam's apple moves superiorly. When our epiglottis closes with the help of sphincter um, muscles, we find too that we can cough and we can actually sneeze, but we also close the glottis with the help of the epiglottis during a maneuver we refer to as the valsalfas maneuver. And we depend on this maneuver all the time. When we go to the bathroom to defecate, we literally try to close off the glottis with the epiglottis to trap air 
in our respiratory tract and that's going to help us increase the pressure in our belly and that of course is going to help with us moving the feces um, out of the body. We also depend on this maneuver when we try to lift the heavy weights. It helps stabilize our trunk and make sure that we do not injure ourselves. So, so far we have discussed the nose, the paranasal sinuses, the larynx and the, the pharynx and the larynx, I should say. We're now ready to move on to the trachea, which we'll do in the next video.